Welcome to Michael Faraday's laboratory from the exact place that Michael Faraday did many of his discoveries. I'm Professor David Ricketts, and I'm here at the Royal Institution in London researching the innovations of Michael Faraday and the other great scientists that have worked here. In addition, the RI has an amazing heritage collection, part of which I'll be able to share with you in today's lecture. And as you probably know, the RI is also known globally for science communication, and I hope this lecture will become part of that amazing legacy. Today I'm going to share with you four of the major discoveries of Michael Faraday. The first one is the discovery of the electric motor. The second is the discovery of magnetic induction. The third, which many people probably already know, the Faraday cage. And then finally, the discovery of a new type of magnetism. I want to thank you again for joining me, and I'd like to start with doing a tour of this amazing laboratory with the head of heritage here at the Royal Institution and my good friend, Charlotte Nim. So we're here in Faraday's lab and my good friend Charlotte is gonna tell us a little bit about the artifacts throughout the lab. So maybe we can start right here with this table. Can you tell us a little bit about what is on the table here? Uh, so this all relates to Faraday's early scientific experimentation from 1820, 1821. Uh, and the most important object from our point of view on this table is this here, which is the earliest version of Faraday's electric motor from 1822. Uh, in our catalogue. I know that there's a debate whether it is from <laughs> right. 1822, but um, we also have some Cruikshank batteries, so basically voltaic piles but laid on their side and troughs yeah, of acid. because I've seen the voltaic pile, but this is really, it just sat on its side. Yeah. And uh, my understanding is, is they would actually pour the acid in to turn the battery on, Yeah. and then they would drain the acid out to turn the battery off. Yep. And these are just different sizes that we have here. They're just different sizes, gotcha. and, and the RA had a lot of these. Uh, um, Farad, uh, Day, Humphrey Davy campaigned to get subscriptions okay. to produce the largest battery. So we, there were 2,000 cells oh, wow. in the battery that was at the RA at the time. Oh, wow. And this here is the famous motor. Um, there's a, a jar here of mercury uh, from Faraday. Um, and there's a missing magnet, but there would be a magnet stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. You'd pour your mercury in, and this wire would then rotate around. Yep. And then over here, he actually floated a magnet on a little piece of string, and it would revolve around this point here. Uh, it turns out a mercury magnet's float, so that was pretty cool. So this is the, the motor. Uh, we have a couple galvanometers uh, over there, and then we have... Uh, Barlow's wheel. So Barlow was an English mathematician mm -hmm. who, after Faraday, made the first principle of that, uh, went on to make his own version of a, a, a motor. All right, Charlotte, tell us a little bit about this bookcase and what we can find on it. I know you've pulled out a, a few specific things we want to learn about. So again, it's more things that Faraday either used to it within his experiments or was given to test. So we have a couple of diamonds, of course. The RI uh, is quite famous for doing um, a Humphrey Davy experiment where he burnt a diamond. So these are burnt diamonds or diamonds he would burn? Uh, diamonds he would burn. Um, so uh, to prove that it's just carbon. To prove it's just carbon, that's yep. great. And this one over here? And this is a, a sample of meteorite that he was given. Um, uh, so it's more like meteorite kind of dust as such. It's not a big lump. I see. And all of these are different chemicals. Now, the one thing that I didn't know about Faraday was that he was really a chemist. Yep. I'm an electrical engineer, so I think he's an electrical engineer. So tell us a little bit about that. So Faraday was actually the first professor of chemistry at the Royal Institution. Uh, he wasn't given that title until um, 1832, but that was his first... Prior to that, he was just a lecturer's assistant. Okay. Um, uh, he did become superintendent of the house as well, so that's just someone that looking after the books of the right. the, the institution right. as a whole. So yeah, he, he was a chemist, and he's got an honorary degree uh, in chemistry, so okay. that there uh, um, that's his background rather than the electricity. Rather than like electricity. All right, there's one other thing that I think you always point out over on the far wall there. Yes, so these are highlights his work in chemistry. These are the earliest known examples of nanoparticles. Um, these are Faraday's colloidal solutions. So where they've got a pinkish tint in them, um, they're gold in sulfuric acid. Um, and Tyndall, actually, after Faraday, was the first to observe that when in a colloidal solution that's never fully mixed, 
when you shine a light through, you get a Tyndall curve, it's now known, of light where the light's been suspended through the, the particles. Oh, wow. um, and there are 16 bottles of nanoparticles here, and 14 of them are still optically active, so they still get the Tyndall curve. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte, so much for showing us around Faraday's lab. Quite right. Before we learn about the discovery of the first electric motor, I want to talk a little bit about Michael Faraday. Growing up, Michael Faraday had a keen interest in science. At the age of 15, he borrowed a shilling from his brother to buy a bottle to do some static electricity experiments. He apprenticed as a bookbinder and was always keen on the books that related to science. Now, many people don't know this, but Michael Faraday, in my opinion, was a little bit entrepreneurial. It's very difficult for somebody who's a bookbinder to get a position in the science community in London at the time. And so Faraday had an idea. He attended lectures of some of the great scientists and would take down notes for himself. But then he realized that perhaps that scientist would like a copy of the notes from their lecture. He attended a lecture of Sir Humphrey Davy, took copious notes, went back to his room, and hand wrote an entire volume of Davy's lectures. He then bound it and came back and presented it to Davy with the request for a job. Now, what's special here is while Davy may or may not have been impressed by this book that Michael Faraday bring, it turns out his assistant had been sacked the week before. And this was a perfect opportunity for Michael to take the position of Davy's assistant. He was hired and for the many years following, joined Davy in his lecturing and also in a tour of Europe in 1814, which brings us to the watershed moment that enabled many of the discoveries of Michael Faraday and other scientists in the early 1800s. And that is right here, the Voltaic Pile. In the summer of 1814, visiting Milan, Volta himself gifted not Sir Humphrey Davy, but Michael Faraday, his assistant, this Voltaic Pile built by Volta himself. Now, the reason why this pile is so important is up until that time, Electricity was just static electricity. No one had any idea of something that we would soon learn that is called current. And the battery was the first apparatus that would let scientists start to explore with this new idea of current and electricity that flowed through things. Let's go up in the theater, which by the way to me really is a second laboratory of Michael Faraday. Many of his great experiments were actually done in the theater, and as we'll learn a little bit later in the lecture, including the famous Faraday cage. Let's go up and learn with my friend Tom from the demonstration team here at the RI how to build a voltaic battery. All right, Tom, um, teach us about a voltaic cell. Okay, so here we've got the fundamental part of our voltaic cell. We've got some zinc, some copper, and electro an electrolyte. In this case, we've got um, felt pads that have been soaked in salt water. So the salt water is actually the electrolyte. This is just a way of putting it on a pile. Right, and you just, you just took a copper sheet and made circles out of them? Well, right? these ones, yes, these are, well, they're copper discs that we drilled, the holes, drilled in. the holes in. These are zinc washers. Zinc washers we, didn't have to, we didn't have to make all of these. All right, and, and you're gonna be able to put together a battery that will light the light? Yes, All right. almost certainly. All right. Go ahead and show us how it's done. So we're starting off with copper. This bit's just to be able to connect to easier. So there's a bit of copper to extend copper base. Okay, so this is where we'll, we'll clip the light onto. Just a little clip sheet, yes. Great. And then we have the electrolyte here, the, the little pad. And then we go zinc, touching copper. Oh, there's no, ah, it's only between. Only between the, it's only between the seconds. So you want the zinc and the copper to contact. Okay. And you have an electro, and then you have the electrolyte to perpetuate it, and then you go again. Okay. Zinc. All right. Copper. Electrolyte. There you go. Zinc. It's Great. Very, it's the same sort of principle as you have with your lemon batteries or potato battery. Right. It's just zinc and, the, zinc and copper is what's doing the reaction. Now, wasn't there a world record here? Well, there was, yes. We had, Tell us about that. Um, so we had, um, it was the largest, we did lemons. It was lemon um, battery. I think it charged a clock we had it hooked up to. Oh yeah, in the world? Was at the time. <laughs> and who beat you? Didn't somebody come back and right after you get the world record? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't right out. It was actually only recently did they yeah. beat us and they 
Wasn't it like 4,000 lemons or something? Um, I believe it was, yes. yes. Awesome. All right, Dad, we just keep on going until we're um, done here? Until we're just about done. We have the right amount of these. Okay. So electrolyte. And does this always work every time? Almost always. Uh, we're um, out of we copper? Yes. So you want to finish with the zinc. So we started with the copper. You finish, finish with the zinc. Okay. So we want to hook them up together. All right, here great. Here we have our light. Okay, awesome. Which you should be able to see there. Okay. We'll hook up the copper bottom to one side. And then the other is going to hook onto the zinc. Fingers crossed. We're going to see light. Yes. Yes, we do. All right. Not connected. 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 You may not be. Really All think. right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom, for the demonstration. We really appreciate it. Brilliant. No worries. Look at that. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks. All right, now that we've seen how to make a voltaic pile, which can be an energy source for what today we call current, we need to learn about two key discoveries in the early 1800s by scientists other than Michael Faraday. The first one is Hans Christian Oersted, and what he noticed is that when he passed a current in a wire and he brought a compass needle nearby, that the needle was deflected. I'll show you this in an experiment in just a little bit. But this discovery that a magnetic needle was influenced by a current carrying wire was another watershed moment of the early 1800s. People had hypothesized that electricity and magnetism were somehow connected. However, no one could demonstrate it. And Orsed, some would say, stumbled upon this very simple way of measuring the interaction between electricity and current. And he noticed that the needle would move in different directions which side he put the compass on. And this was shared throughout Europe, and in fact, another researcher, André-Marie Ampère in France, learned of this work, and he too repeated the same experiments with a compass and a current-carrying wire. Now, what Ampère did was one step more. He took his compass, he put it next to the wire, and he saw it deflect. And he then moved the compass around the wire. Now, they didn't have AA batteries as I have here in my demonstration. And actually, by this time, they had moved on to a different type of battery from the voltaic pile, a Cruikshank battery, which is shown here. And these are really cool because you would just add acid inside to turn it on. And what Ampere did is Ampere put this in a circuit with a loop of wire, and he put his compass on, and he moved that compass around the wire. Now, here comes the key moment he took that compass needle and he put it on top of the battery. And he saw that it was deflected too, just like it was on the wire. And this was the discovery that in this circuit, something was continually flowing around that created or affected magnetic fields. And it was this discovery of the interaction of electricity or, if you will, uh, current carrying wires and magnetism that led Faraday to the key discovery of the electric motor. I'm going to share with you a little bit more about Ampere's work and show you a few examples of some coils that you can build to explore the interaction between electricity and magnetism. Let's go back up to the theater and we'll see a demonstration. Thanks. All right, uh, I wanted to show you two coils uh, that were actually built by Ampere. Uh, at the same time that Faraday was developing his work on the motor. I've got uh, a single coil of copper, and then I've got multiple turns of copper, which we would call a solenoid. And that comes the, from the Greek for canal, and Ampere was the one who coined that name for this kind of structure. Now, I've got a very strong magnet right here, and I'll just kind of put it up, and you can see this copper is not at all attracted to this magnetic field. Now, I'm just going to take a AA battery, and I'm going to stick it in this coil, and suddenly the current flows, and as we learn from Orsted, that this current carrying wire will interact with a magnet. So it has a magnetic field here, it's repelling, and let's see if I can get it back to, there we go, we can see it's attracting me right there. So I put it up, it attracts. Let's go over and take a look at the solenoid. Take the same battery over, and place it in the solenoid. Now what's interesting is we can see the solenoid also has the, let me see if I, there we, go. there we go. Also has the same properties. You can see it's attracted here, and if I turn my magnet over, it's repelled, and the other side comes. 
And Ampere built this device, there we go, as a way to model a bar magnet. Here, the magnetic field goes through the center and then comes back around, just like it does on a bar magnet. In fact, Ampere and Faraday both looked at the iron filings around a small coil and a bar magnet and found they looked identical. This is one of the things that led Ampere to believe that magnetism, all magnetism, magnetism in lodestones, magnetism in magnets, magnetism in the earth, is all due to circulating currents in a coil. In fact, Ampere, in one of his first weeks of working with coils and repeating Orsted's experiment, came up with the theory that the Earth's magnetic field is created just by circulating currents. And it turns out today, the way we explain magnetism is exactly the same. Magnetism is simply, you can think of, a small circulating current or charge inside of material. For a lot of materials, that's gonna be the spin of the electron. For other materials, it could be small domains. Ampere, not knowing about electrons, atoms, or anything, really didn't have any idea of what caused this, but he did spend a good deal of his life trying to understand, is there really small current circulating in a magnet, or is it something on the microscopic scale? Which he didn't know, but turns out is the way it works today. And so we can think about magnetism from these coils, and it also allows us to understand how one would go from a coil of wire, creating a magnetic field, to using a permanent magnet and vice versa. These, if you will, are equivalent, and we'll see when we look at induction that Faraday also used that when he moved from a coil to a magnet to induce induction. All right, I have in front of me an apparatus that I built to explain the four inventive steps of the electric motor that Michael Faraday did. We'll start with the first one that he did on September 3rd, 1821, and work through the process of this discovery or invention. Now, what's amazing is each one of these happened all within one day. He started at, I don't know, 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning with the first experiment, and he finished with a working motor in the evening. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with Orsted's experiment, as I described before. So right now you can see on the camera, we've got a needle. Uh, there's no current running through this wire. I'm gonna turn on some current and you can immediately see the needle move. And now what we can do is we can move the needle around or the compass around. And what we notice is the needle seems to follow in a circle around the compass. And that's something that Orsted noticed and Ampere and Faraday noticed. Now, Faraday did the same compass experiment, but then he started to do his own experimentation. What he did is he got a magnetized needle, and the magnetized needle he brought next to the current carrying wire. And you can see right there, what he noticed was is the needle would stick, but interestingly enough, it doesn't stick at the end, it sticks a little bit inward. Let's see if we can get the other side to stick. There we go. So you can see it's sticking not at the end, but here. And what he noticed is it really didn't like to, if you just notice it repelled, it doesn't like to be close to the ends. In fact, we can get this nice little oscillation here because it's actually repelled on the two ends. It's attracted closer in. And this was key because Faraday started to think about a different ways that the magnet moved, or sorry, that the magnetic needle moved. And now let's go take a look at his uh, lab notebook. And you can see he's done a succession of drawings of an attraction and repulsion of the magnetic needle in the different positions. Now, then he did something else. And if we look to the other page in his notebook, we can notice what he did, which was a thought experiment. Here, we were looking at a needle and seeing how it reacted to a current carrying wire. What he thought about is, what would a current carrying wire do around a magnetic needle? Now the magnetic needle is just a small version of a bar magnet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually do Michael Faraday's thought experiment. I've got this little wire here. And um, I just hook up, I'm just switching over the power. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see what the wire does around the pole of a magnet. And once again, Michael Faraday did this as a thought experiment. We're gonna do it so that you can visualize what Michael Faraday had done. 
And as we move up, there we go. Just want to make sure we've got everything connected properly. There we go. All right. So now I've got a current carrying wire. Notice that the wire doesn't stick to the end. It revolves around the pole. And if we go back and look at Faraday's notebook, we can see that's exactly what he shows, that the wire moves around the pole of the magnets. Just let's do this once again. I put it on this side. It quickly goes around. And by the way, if I go to the other side, we'll see um, my it does work the other way. It's not as flexible in that direction. So we're just going to continue to do this one here. So it goes around the pole of the magnet. Now, of course, he couldn't see the wire rotate. He could just see the wire moving back and forth. And he thought to himself, um, Wollaston, who was a researcher with Davy, had seen Orsted's experiment and had proposed this idea that perhaps a wire could revolve. And, and when he was looking at this wire moving around, his thought was, well, it's really trying to revolve around the pole. It's not trying to spin. And so what he did is he created this. Uh, this is a crank. I'll pull it out here so you can kind of see it here. There's the shape. It looks like uh, just a crank or a crank handle. Now, Faraday built a somewhat complex apparatus using mercury and corks to float this crank and attach current to it. What I've done is I've just created curls of wire that keep everything connected, but allow it to rotate. So different apparatus. And the reason I do that is this is much more environmentally friendly. And you can actually build this yourself if you wanted to. All right, we've got our current going. Let's see what we got. And you can see it's attracted right away. I'm going to just try to get it. Let's see that. It rotates. It rotates right around. And you notice it hits. And Michael Faraday even noted that if he could get out of the way, Look at that. See how it rotates? So all he needed to do was figure out a way to get it from not hitting the magnet. And by the way, you can do this. It doesn't have to be um, straight. It can be at an angle like this. And so his idea was, well, let me just take my magnet and let me just stick it down. So he stuck his magnet down in some wax. And then all he did was he just took his crank apparatus. He straightened out his crank into a piece of wire, just like this, this piece of wire. And now he would have put this magnet in a bowl of mercury. We can kind of look over here and you can see the bowl of mercury and you can see the vertical wire that he has. So this is exactly the same setup. I'm just using this copper disc to allow it to have electrical conduction as it rotates around. And let me connect the power here at the bottom. We already see some movements, and I'm going to jiggle this around a little bit. There we go. And now we see it revolving around the magnet exactly as Faraday had seen. And that was the four inventive steps to invent the electric motor. Let's build one ourselves now. All right, we're set to make our own Faraday motor. So what I did is I went on Amazon and I bought this coil of wire. It's the three millimeters in diameter, roughly a meter long. And you actually don't have to do anything. You set it down and pull up the center. That's what I did right here. You can see it's the original coil. I just pulled up the center. And it has a little loop here that I did with a pair of pliers. And then I took a straight piece of wire. And I put that straight piece of wire in here. And this wire here is now going to be the same one as Faraday's wire over there. Now, we're not going to use a bowl of mercury. What we're going to use is a circular neodymium magnet. And I got this, uh, it's about 40 or 50 millimeters in diameter. I got it off of Amazon. Uh, and what's key is because it's round, it's actually going to allow the wire to touch it and to revolve around it. And I'll show you that in a second. Now, I also have a strip of aluminum foil, and this is just to make contact to the magnet. So I'm going to place the magnet in the center there. And what I try to do is I try to put my wire right over the center of the, um, of the magnet. And now I'm going to get my leads, and I'm going to attach them. Uh, and so I've got one lead there. And now I'm just going to pull up my other lead right here. There we go. I think those should work fine. And let's turn it on. And there you go. There is a Faraday motor. And we made it in about 60 seconds, maybe a little bit longer to get the parts out there. But it's super simple. And it operates exactly the same way Faraday's motor worked. And we didn't discuss the operation, so we'll just take a moment here to explain it. The current is actually flowing down the wire. 
And the magnet itself has a magnetic field that's coming out in this direction. And so we have a current and a magnetic field that are crossing one another, and they produce a torque in the, if you remember your right hand or left hand rule, it's going to produce a torque uh, or a force, if you will, perpendicular to the intersection of those two forces. And that's what is rotating this around. I hope you can make one at home. They're super fun, and as I showed you, they're super easy to make. Now, let's go up into the theater and learn a little bit more about the Heritage Collection, and we could also learn about Michael Faraday's next discovery, magnetic induction. Welcome. I'm here with my friend Charlotte New, um, head of collections here at the Royal Institution. She's brought out several artifacts that I thought were kind of cool, and maybe she can tell us a little bit about them. Uh, let's start with this handsome gentleman right here. Who's this? So this is a miniature bust of Michael Faraday. Okay. Um, it's based on a much larger bust that we have of, um, done by Nobel, which is in the lower ground floor here at the Royal Institution. Um, and it's a direct scale model. It was done by a pantograph system in the late 1800s. Oh, one of those things that you just take one point and draw and it makes a smaller yeah. point on the other side. Very cool. And I was just going to say the major collection of these uh, mini ones are, is in a museum in Vancouver. No, Toronto. Oh, Canada. And now there's a story behind the bigger bust this was copied from, right? Yes. So the large bust uh, done by Nobel of Faraday uh, was borrowed by Margaret Thatcher. Oh. After her visit that she had at the Royal Institution, she made it known that Faraday was one of her heroes. So uh, the bust was promptly removed from uh, display here and given to Number 10 Downing Street. So when the door opened in Number 10 Downing Street, you would come across the bus. Faraday. Faraday was the first person to greet you. Yes. And, and when you say borrow, was it like for a day or did she keep it like the entire time she was there? Uh, the entire time that she was prime minister from 1980 through to when John Major took over. Okay, wow, that's fantastic. All right, we've got some other great stuff. Um, this right here is not an artifact, but uh, my friend Tom and I, we just built this voltaic pile. Can you tell us about the thing to the other side? So this is an original voltaic pile. Okay. Uh, this was given by Volta uh, when Faraday and Davy met him in Milan in 1814. Uh, Faraday was assisting Davy on his grand tour of Europe um, and they went to see Volta. Um, and Volta actually gave this as a gift to Faraday rather than to the most famous chemist of the world. Yeah. But what's really cool is not only is it a voltaic cell, it was built by Volta. It was indeed, yes. Very cool. So now um, we've got two items that we're going to actually do a demo with in a little bit, but I want to kind of maybe turn over here and talk about this. This is uh, one of Faraday's actual notebooks, correct? Yes. So there are 13 in the collection here, um, and they're, they're all part of the UNESCO Memory of the World, the UK entry. Uh, so they're as important as the Doomsday Book and Churchill's archive okay. uh, in, RI, in UK archive terms. Um, but this is the notebook from 1831 that deals specifically with his uh, demonstrations and working up in experiments of his induction ring and then moving on to the generator. And it's also where I think he first started to realize he was doing significant work because from this point on, he numbers his paragraph. So he has paragraph number one. Oh, wow. Oh. That is paragraph number one. That is paragraph number uh, one. If you read, he'll go to paragraph two or 3,000, I think, he had in, at yeah. the end of his life. Uh, 16, 16,600 and something. There you go. Uh, that is a lot of work. And this is all handwritten by him, right? Yeah. And what I love is he actually puts on the pages a little drawing of what he was working on. So for somebody like myself who's very visual, uh, the language is a little bit old to understand what he's talking about, but there's always a picture when it's something really cool, so I thought that was great. And he also, the pencil line is because he's written it up as a paper. Oh, that's so right. If he's published it as a paper, there's a pencil line through. And, and while we're here, I'm going to put on some gloves so I can touch. Um, while we're on that page, let's just talk about, this is the actual ring. Yes. From that page yeah. that he discovered uh, magnetic induction with, is that correct? That is correct. So this is the 29th of August, 19, 1831, um, and that is the actual induction right. It took him 10 days to wind the uh, wire around oh the goodness. iron ring. So you can actually see uh, there's different coils of the wire spaced out with a hand-laid layer in between. And I believe reading in the notebook, I don't know if it's this one, but I think each coil is maybe like 150 to 200 feet. Yes. 
that he would wind. And just so we can see them matching together, there's the coil right together on there. Um, fantastic. Now, we've got the original one, which I think is super cool. We have in the collection. And then there was a gentleman here who built a reproduction, right? Yeah, so we've always done demos as part of uh, any lectures that we've done mm -hmm. here. Uh, it was a big thing that Faraday uh, was a proponent of. He, he felt that everything should be illustrated with a demonstration. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a very famous gentleman in, in RI history called uh, William Coates, Bill Coates. So he was the lecturer's assistant from the 19, late 1930s all mm -hmm. the way through until mid-1980s. Uh, and, he and he built, built this, this in about the nine, late 50s, early 60s, so that they, uh, before that, they actually used Faraday's ring to really? demonstrate. Yes. Oh, wow. So, I mean, if you look at the two, they're very similar. And we're going to actually do a demonstration with this one here. And over here is another demonstration. Do you want me to move the... Can I pick it up? Yeah, yeah. I was you just sure? going to move the pile out of the way. What's going to happen to the... Okay. And this is a coil, and this is an iron core. Yeah. So we'll talk about it in a moment, but we have the original one where he induced a magnetic field to couple from one coil to the other. Here's where he has a coil and puts a magnet inside and induces a voltage and a current by moving in uh, and out the magnet. And, and, oh, there you go. Just to put the two right there. And he's got a little picture showing exactly this. And what I think's great, he actually shows how he hung it. There's a piece of string he would hang it up with that's in his diagram there. And we have a, another demonstration one that we'll show here in a second that will be uh, used to show induction. All right, Charlotte, this is fantastic. Um, thank you so much for sharing this heritage collection with us. And I think it's time we now go do some demos with our demo objects. Thanks again. You're welcome. Now that we've learned a little bit about heritage, let's go and learn about the actual induction experiments that Michael Faraday did. All right, now we're gonna do a demonstration of Faraday's discovery of magnetic induction. So I have right here uh, the reproduction coil that had been made, and this is an iron ring on the uh, left side here. There's uh, several hundred feet of wire coiled around, and on the right-hand side, there's another set of uh, several hundred feet of wire coiled, and the two are separated. And what I've done is I've connected one end of it up to an instrument over here called a galvanometer. The galvanometer actually is a very simple device, and it came from Orsted's discovery that a current-carrying wire would affect the needle compass. And all the uh, galvanometer does is it just wraps a coil around a compass, and when current flows through, it'll deflect that current needle. And that's what we have right over here. I've got a filming here, so when we do it, I'll do a close-up and you can see it. So all I'm gonna do is the same experiment that Faraday did. I have an energy source, in this case it's a power supply, and I'm just gonna attach it. And we see the needle moves when I attach it, and then it goes back to where it was. If I let go, we'll see the needle moves in exactly the opposite direction. And this was the phenomena that Faraday noticed, was that when he connected, there was a movement of the needle, it would return to its original place, and then when he disconnected, it would move back. And in fact, to increase the speed of disconnection, he would actually take a hammer and knock the connection off to get the fastest disconnection so he could see the biggest change, because he realized it was the rate at which it changed was important. He also did this with magnets. Uh, uh, in the um, uh, increase and decrease of the magnetic field. And I'll show you that, that in just a moment. Um, but we've seen here, and I'll just do it once again real quick, and actually we can see it's turning clockwise, and it goes counterclockwise, and if I simply just put opposite the coils, we'll see that when I connect it, just a moment, I'm waiting until it's slowed down, it jumps counterclockwise, and then when it releases, so counterclockwise, it goes clockwise. So it does exactly the opposite of what it did as we do this. Now, why was Faraday so successful in magnetic induction? It turns out several scientists had seen this phenomena before. In fact, Ampere actually saw this same phenomena, but he thought it was just some mistake in his experimental apparatus and, and never followed it up. What was key for Faraday was not only was he a great experimentalist, but he also spent a lot of time thinking about the experiments, and any detail that was not explained wasn't something he would dismiss. He'd often write it down, 
and come back to it and try to think of a different experiment to explain it. And the reason Faraday was successful over all the others was amplification. And so what Faraday did first off is he realized that the iron core seemed to increase what he would call magnetism. He also made sure that there were uh, several hundred feet and he knew that more wire would create more of a magnetic field as we saw with the demonstration of a simple solenoid. So what he basically did is just amplify the effect by using an iron ring, which would have the most closed magnetic flux as we'd say today, and then as many turns as he could put on one side and as many turns as he could put on the other side. And it was that amplification that allowed him to see the movement of the needle and then his experiments from them helped him understand the phenomena that we know today as magnetic induction. Now, this is one where the energy source is coupled over. This is what we call a transformer. I could take a magnet and I could place it inside the coil, out, and if we look over at our galvanometer, we can actually see the needle starts to move a little bit when I do that. Uh, a better solution for that would be to wound a coil around a magnet and just simply pull it out. And remember before, I said that Ampere was the first one to say that a coil of wire could mimic a magnet. So in the original, we have a coil of wire. And so moving to the idea of using a magnet is pretty straightforward because a coil of wire can be thought of as a magnet. And so once again, we'll just pull these two apart and you'll see the lights light up there. And so we have magnetic induction from the magnet moving inside of a coil. And as Faraday explained it, it's all about a coil cutting magnetic field lines is the way he described it. So here we're actually physically moving the magnetic field lines around. Here on this coil, the time change is creating the magnetic fields to build up and to go down. And it's that change in field that's cutting the wire to create the induction. And these are the two instruments that Michael Faraday did to do his seminal work on magnetic induction. Now let's move on to Michael Faraday's third discovery and probably the one that's best known by everyone, the Faraday cage. Now we're gonna go back to the theater, not because I wanted to do a demonstration there, because the theater is the actual place where Michael Faraday built the first ever Faraday cage. Let's go up and take a look. We are in the exact spot that Faraday built his famous Faraday cage. Now, a lot of people think about it maybe as being a small box, but it actually was 12 feet by 12 feet. So here in the theater, you can see the start of the bench here. The Faraday cage actually sat on the first row of seats, about three feet high, and it came all the way out and ended approximately here, 12 feet wide, 12 feet tall. Why did Faraday want to build such a large cage? It's because he wanted to go inside of it with a lab bench and perform experiments. He was interested to understand what happened inside the Faraday cage, doing experiments, and what happened outside. Now, the whole idea of a Faraday cage actually started with Benjamin Franklin. He was the first one to notice when he was doing electrostatic experiments that if you looked inside of a conducting ball, there was no fields. If you put a charge in, it didn't move anywhere. And he didn't know why it was, but a friend of him mentioned that to a French scientist, Coulomb, who investigated that quite a bit further and eventually developed Coulomb's law. And it became known that for some reason inside these metallic bodies that charge, our electric fields wouldn't exist. So what we want to do is we want to do a, uh, a, a reproduction in a simplified form uh, of Faraday's key experiments. Now, this was put together by my student, uh, Priya Darshni. Uh, she was very creative. Um, as you can see, our Faraday cage is gonna be made of two uh, strainers. Um, and I've built homemade electroscopes. And all these are is just two thin pieces of foil. And uh, we're gonna charge them up. And I'll show you how it works. Uh, this is our charging stick. This is a uh, electric fly swatter off of Amazon. I think it was $7, but it does a great job because you just press a button, you get charged. So I'm going to go ahead and charge up uh, our cage here. And what do we notice? Well, first off, you notice we've got, you may be hard to see, there's a thread that's come out. But you can see here that these two, I've been charged, these two right here have opened up. They're repelling. The charge that we've put on this strainer 
has gone everywhere. And this is the key part. Now, if you think about it, if you have two electrons, if they're on a conductor and can move freely, if they're the same charge, they want to repel. So the electrons are going to run as far away as they can from every other electron. And the result is, is they distribute themselves uniformly over the entire surface of the strainer and also of the foils here. I'm just going to go back and give a little bit more charge. There you go. And now I'm just going to let me go back and undo these. There we go. Ah, there we go. Let's get it reset here. All right, I'm going to charge it up. And what I want you to notice is the string and these open up, but this one doesn't. And the reason for that is this one is conducted by a thread, or connected by a thread. There's no electrical conduction. So while all the electrons are spreading out around this sphere and that two pieces of foil, none can get away from there. Now watch what happens when I take a second foil, or a strainer, and I come in and notice the top set of foil. Do you see how it goes down? It's because all the charge has left it so that it can go outside of this other surface. So all the charge is on the outside because it's trying to run away from every other charge around it. And if I move it, uh, it looks like I might have discharged it. So we're going to try another trick. I'm just going to charge it up. Putting lots of charge all over the surface. There's going to be charge on this surface and that surface. But when I move away, you can see there's charge on the surface. If you can see this thread. And then as I move it forward, you notice how this one opens up because it's connected through a little copper wire on the top, but this one doesn't. And this is exactly what Faraday wanted to measure. He noticed when he got inside the Faraday cage and he insulated, anything that was insulated did not talk to the outside. And you can see as we pull this away, the one on your left doesn't change, but the one on the right opens up because the charge spreads out through the conductor everywhere. The charge now gets spread over the other one, has no effect. So now we're going to do a different experiment. I'm just going to short both of these. I'm now going to add charge here. Let's see if I can do it. OK. You see it's open. I'm now going to close the Faraday cage. And you notice it stays open. It doesn't fall because electrically the electrons can't go anywhere. And so the Faraday cage has no effect. And this is what Faraday found. Inside the cage, he could perform electrostatic experiments. They operated exactly as they were outside because they were insulated. But if anything inside could communicate with the cage, all of the electrons would suddenly run to the outside and disappear. And so this is probably the world's smallest version of the Faraday cage done at the exact spot where probably one of the biggest Faraday cages ever were. Thanks. So here we are back in Faraday's laboratory. And I have right here the exact experimental setup that Michael Faraday did to learn a new form of magnetism. Now, before Faraday had discovered this effect, which is known as diamagnetism, um, whenever you put anything in a magnetic field, if it was metallic, it would align itself with the, metallic, with the uh, field. And it would generally be attracted if it was a um, ferromagnetic material, so maybe a piece of iron would align itself and go to one of the poles, so it was attracted. So if you will, you probably know metals, many metals are attracted by magnets, and that was well known at the time. But what Michael Faraday discovered, and he discovered it right here, um, was that some materials are repelled by a magnetic field, and that was completely different from every other idea people had of magnetism. So what we have right here is, it's hard to see, but inside of the table here, underneath the table, is uh, probably at the time the world's largest electromagnet. It is a chain from a large ship's anchor that they just cut the top of the chain link. It's one giant link, about this big around, goes underneath the table and comes back. It's wrapped with wires. And these two are poles that help uh, focus the magnetic field. And what he did is, in this glass jar, he would take a piece of uh, material, and he would hang it. And what he noticed is some materials, like glass and bismuth, instead of aligning with the magnetic field in this direction, they would turn perpendicular. If you will, 
they were repelled from the poles. So if we take a rectangular piece and we were to put it inside here, the two poles like this, the two poles would want to move as far away from the, these magnet poles as we could. Sorry, the two ends of the material would want to move as far away. And so this repulsion by a magnetic field was brand new, and Faraday came up with a word which he called diamagnetism. Now, the problem is that once he created this, this set of materials called diamagnet, magnet, no, sorry, diamagnetism or diamagnetic, the issue is, well, what do you do with everything that was just regular magnetic material before? And so what he did is he called those paramagnetic. I remember it this way because they align themselves parallel between the two poles. That's how I remember. So diamagnetism is a brand new form of magnetism where materials are repelled by a magnetic field and paramagnetism where materials are attracted by a magnetic field. And the basis for this is something Faraday could have never known because at that time they didn't even know there was an electron, let alone how an atom was made. Well, it turns out that the electrons in all atoms have a spin and the spin we generally refer to it as either being up or down. And if we just have one electron with a spin up, that's sort of like a circulating current and it creates a magnetic field. And in fact, as I mentioned before, with Ampere, he sort of started this idea that magnetic fields are created by actually circulating currents. In the atom, it's the electron spinning, if you will, that creates a little magnetic field. Well, if we have a spin up electron and we pair it with a spin down electron, they should cancel, right? And they do, except when you put them in a magnetic field. What happens is one of the spins becomes more dominant and it opposes the magnetic field that it's in. And that is why the material repels. So any material where all the electrons are paired up, spin up, spin down, are diamagnetic because in the sense of a field, one gets just a little bit stronger than the other to oppose the magnetic field and gets pushed away. In paramagnetic materials, what happens is we have all those same paired electrons, but then there's one, two, or several unpaired electrons around the atom. And those unpaired electrons give it a net magnetic property that then cause it to be attracted to a magnetic field. And then we have other materials that we call ferromagnets you may have heard of. Those are just materials where there's a macrostructure where um, uh, the atoms form crystals together or structure together that align themselves in the material so all the atoms, if you will, cooperate and we get an even stronger magnetic field in those ferromagnets. But for what Faraday discovered, it's diamagnetism and paramagnetism. And what I want to do is I want to do a great demonstration to show you that some everyday objects are diamagnetic and paramagnetic. Let's switch over to the demonstration of those two materials. All right, so I've put together my experiment to demonstrate diamagnetism. Now I have a balance here. I have a stick and I have two specimens at the ends. You can probably see they are grapes, your average garden variety grape. And these are diamagnetic principally because they're full of water and water is diamagnetic. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop that as best I can from rotating. I've put a sheet of kitchen foil underneath so that if any drops or anything gets down, we don't damage the bench. So I'm going to get out the same neodymium magnet I had before. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it very close, but I'm not going to touch the grape. And right now, there we go, perfect. And now I am pushing it around with the magnetic field. And I'm about a millimeter or so away from the grape. And there you go. And I can keep on pushing this around as much as I want. There we go. So what we're seeing right here is the magnet is uh, pushing the grape. The grape is repelled by the magnet. Now I can flip it over to the other pole. Doesn't make a difference because a diamagnetic material is repelled by either magnetic field. It opposes the magnetic field. So it doesn't matter which north or south we have of the magnet. It's there. Okay. So now that's diamagnetism. Now what I want to do is show you paramagnetism. All right. So don't tell anyone because there's no eating in the lab, but 
I need to stick. And now what am I going to do for paramagnetism? Well, I'm going to take this aluminum sheet and I'm going to tear it in half. And you may not have known that aluminum is paramagnetic. Yes, it is. You probably thought aluminum was not magnetic at all. And so what we're going to do is I've got my two balls here and now I'm going to rebalance it. Take me a second to rebalance it here. Now I'm going to do the same experiment. There we go. All right, now I'm going to redo the experiment, but this time I'm going to use the magnet to attract. So the magnet will actually be in the direction of. And if you're doing this at home, I'll just let you know that when you first put the magnet up, you push a little bit of air and that little bit of air tends to make it seem like it is pushing away. But once that air goes away, now you can see it. I am pulling oops, this around with my magnet. And there you have it. Super cool. Attracting aluminum due to its paramagnetism. And that was a word also, as I mentioned, coined by Faraday because once he discovered diamagnetism, he needed to have a word for everything else. All right, that finishes the four discoveries of Michael Faraday. I really appreciate you joining me to learn about these four discoveries of Michael Faraday in this amazing place, his own laboratory. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you learned a little bit about history, a little bit about science, and also about the Royal Institution. And I appreciate all the support that you do for everything here at the RI. And I want to thank the amazing staff here, Charlotte New and Heritage, the demonstration team, and everyone for helping me make this lecture, the first one from Faraday's lab, possible. Thank you and take care.